And so um, we are back into the Gospel of Mark, and this is part six. Um, and so this evening we'll look at chapter nine uh, as we continue to reflect on what the Gospel of Mark is all about. It's the authority of Jesus. Uh, we know that as we went through Matthew, we looked at um, that kingdom, uh, the kingdom of heaven that uh, was ushered in with Jesus. And um, Mark alludes to that, but but uh, he's telling the good news, the account of Jesus uh, from a different perspective. Uh, same accounts, many of them, uh, same when, when we get into Luke, but from a different perspective and how, how he views those circumstances. But, you know, the Holy Spirit was behind it all. And that's what's beautiful is that we get a, a more full picture I think that's when you think about when we share in koinonia with one another, then after we look at scripture, um, we each share what's on our hearts and, and that gives us that shared perspective um, because you'll share something that wasn't on my heart because it was on your heart and you share that and each person brings that to the table and it's almost like we, we're going to a... Uh, um, a potluck and uh, the Lord has each one of us bring a dish and we all um, enjoy from that dish. We all can eat from that dish. Uh, but this is from a very spiritual sense. And so as we, uh, as we move into chapter nine, it begins, then Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God arrive with power. And he was prophetically talking about the fact that he had to die, be buried, and be resurrected in order to usher in the kingdom of God. He said it was near, the kingdom of God is here, meaning himself, but the gospel is all about him sacrificing his life for all of mankind and for him to actually be retransformed from dead to life and in that transformation ushered in the kingdom of God. And he was telling them, he says, some of you will not taste death before you see the kingdom of God arrive with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. He led them up a high mountain by themselves. So no crowds, no other people, just the four of them heading up this mountain. On this mountain, he was transfigured before them. They were watching him to be transfigured in the same way uh, that John, during his revelation while he was on the island of Patmos, saw Jesus in a transformed state. So this was a miracle in, in its own right, as they were watching this, and his clothes became radiantly white, brighter than any launderer or on earth could bleach them. So, I mean, they were, Mark's trying to tell you that it was the brightest white that you could envision. And Elijah and Moses appeared before them, take, talking with Jesus. So here's James and Peter and John brought up by Jesus. He wanted them to witness this. And they're watching him become transformed, radiantly white, and Elijah and Moses appeared talking with Jesus. We know that we live within a created dimension. The earth, the trees, the water, the universe is all created within the realm of heaven. And this creation, this biome, this giant biome that God created that we call Earth and um, the universe and the galaxies within that universe um, is within its own little dimension. Well, right here, those three disciples were getting a glimpse of what the true dimension was all about because Right then, Jesus was transformed, and Elijah and Moses were right there talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, 
it is good for us to be here. He started getting all excited. In fact, um, he was getting giddy at this point. And he said, let us put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For they were all so terrified that Peter didn't know what else to say. They were just overwhelmed. What they were witnessing was beyond what a uh, an average human will ever witness is that they were watching Jesus transform with Elijah and Moses and that they were all talking with one another. And I'm supposing that Peter, James, and John were wondering, why did he bring us up here? And now they were witnessing why he brought them up there. And then a cloud appeared and it enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud. Once again, we see the two dimensions are are colliding as God can open himself up in this dimension anytime, anywhere, and any way he wants to. And he said, God said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them except Jesus. So they knew that Elijah and Moses were there, but they were gone now. And suddenly when they looked, um, they, were co- uh, they, they saw nobody but Jesus. And then they were coming down the mountain and Jesus admonished them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Because he had just got done telling them that some of you are going to witness the coming of the kingdom of God. They got a glimpse of what the kingdom of God looks like, feels like. They were overwhelmed. Then while he was coming down the mountain, he says, since I gave you this glimpse of heaven, of the kingdom, of my kingdom, and you heard the father say, listen to me. Jesus is telling them, he's admonishing them, don't tell anyone about this until I have been risen from the dead. So they kept this matter to themselves, discussing what it meant to rise from the dead. They, they were trying to understand what Jesus was really saying, that he was going to die and then rise from the dead. Um, they just saw Elijah and Moses, and they were thinking, my, you know, are they dead? Are they alive? I'm sure that they were completely overwhelmed. And so they asked Jesus, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he replied, Elijah does indeed come first, and he restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected? So he turns it around on them, and where he was talking about him being risen from the dead, they were talking about seeing Elijah. And, you know, why does he come first? But then Jesus said, I tell you that Elijah has indeed come, and they have done to him whatever they wished, just as it is written about him. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and scribes were arguing with them. As normal, when they got into the crowds, the religious leaders, the Bible scholars, they were all coming out so they could argue um, with the disciples and with Jesus. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were filled with awe and they ran to greet him. What are you disputing with them? He asked. Well, someone in the crowd replied, teacher, I brought you my son who has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they were unable. Jesus said, O unbelieving generation, how long must I remain with you? He was starting to really feel the weight and the burden of mankind and their disobedient lack of faith and the ways that they were living their lives. And he said, how long must I put up with you? And then he said, bring the boy to me. So they brought him and seeing Jesus, the spirit 
immediately threw the boy into a convulsion because, you know, this this demon that was within him uh, knew who Jesus was and was immediately reacting to the presence of Jesus. And so Jesus asked uh, the, the boy, he asked the boy's father, how long has this been with him? So he wanted to know how long this boy has had a demon. And he said from childhood, it often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. So if you can imagine this, here they are sitting around, and all of a sudden, this guy's son is chucked into the fire that they're probably using for warmth or to cook with, or chucks him into the water and tries to drown him. And then at that time, he said, uh, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can, echo Jesus. All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd had come running, he rebuked the unclean spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you to come out and never enter him again. So at that point, you could see that Jesus was listening. He was he was hearing someone who said, I do believe, but he was also dealing with so much uh, humanity that lacked faith. But nevertheless, he cast the demon out. And after shrieking and convulsing him violently, the spirit came out. The boy became like a corpse. So that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet. And he stood up and Jesus had gone into the house. His disciples asked him privately. So now Jesus goes into the house after he cast the demon out and his pri a private conversation kicks off. Why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus answered, this kind cannot come out except by prayer. And so we know that prayer is so powerful. And we were discussing that just moments before um, we jumped into this chapter. Prayer moves the hand of God. And Jesus is saying, if you have faith, if you believe, then something like this can come out by prayer. Going on from there, they passed through Galilee. But Jesus did not want anyone to know because he was teaching his disciples. So he's passing through Galilee. He's trying to be covert, trying to slide through. Why? Because he was teaching his disciples. He wanted to share koinonia with them. He wanted to experience that brotherly love with them. And he wanted to teach them. And he told them, the son of man will be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they didn't understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Then they came to Capernaum, and while Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. Well, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and the servant of all. Then he had a little child come and stand among them and taking the child by his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but the one who sent me. And so John said to him, well, teacher, we saw someone else driving out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him, but he does not accompany us. And Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who performs a miracle in my name 
can turn around and speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Indeed, if anyone gives you a cup of water because you bear the name of Christ, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two hands and go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where their, uh, their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. So you know that he is telling them, if you are going to practice sin, it's best for you to remove whatever causes that because it's better for you to enter without that into the kingdom of God than it is to be thrown into the lake of fire. He goes on to say, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its saltiness, with what will you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. He says a lot just in these few sentences. So he, he's sharing that they should pluck their eye out or cut their hand off or cut their foot off. If this was the case, we would be walking around with no eyes and no hands and no feet because we are sinful. So what was Jesus really teaching? Don't practice sin. Don't think that you have a license to sin. Don't do this. And if you are going to practice this, then it's better for you to cut off your, your hands and pluck out your eyes or cut off your feet. And then he goes in to say that salt is good, but if the salt loses its saltiness, can you imagine we use salt for a spice? If, if it loses its saltiness, what would you season it with? In other words, there is nothing. Have salt among yourselves, he says. In other words, allow us to be in Christ and allow the spirit to move among us so that he can bring salt, spice to our very conversation and be at peace with one another. Don't argue with one another. Don't take issue with someone because you perceive it one way and, and they perceive it another. It's better to leave it alone. But what is true and what is pure comes from the Lord. And as we've been looking in chapter 9 of Mark, this is truth. This is good news. And this is a, an opportunity for us to not only see the power of God, but for Jesus teaching concepts, precepts for us to hold on to and realize, hey, we need to, to have salt among us. And we need to be at peace with one another because this is what the Lord told us that we should have. So that concludes chapter nine of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and the next time we get together, we'll uh, dive into chapter 10.